Welcome to a brief overview of the strategic models relevant to HRM on BMAM 702. The full lecture is available on the Blackboard site. When you're thinking about strategic HRM, it has three levels. The corporate level, which is overarching, the business level, which would be the individual silos, and then the collaborative HRM activities, which would be more at the team or the functional level. Here's a definition from Armstrong which is useful and we'll be looking at how this manages to express itself in the models. Here we have the potential relationships between organizational strategy and HR. You can have two silos as in A in separation. You can have organizational strategy driving the HR strategy so that there's ensuring there's a fit. You can have a dialogue between the two where the organizational strategy is more dominant. This is the most common one that you're likely to see. There's also a holistic one, which is rare, but it does happen in organizations. And sometimes you have HR driving the organizational strategy, and this would be very rare indeed. The matching model from Michigan, here we have Devana's expression of it. You've got the external political, economic and cultural forces coming to bear on an organization which has to deal with its own internal mission and strategic direction as well as the structure and the capability and flexibility within that and HRM itself and its strategy. We've got external fit which is more about vertical integration taking in from the outside very much top down and the internal fit which is the horizontal integration between the three elements you saw. Gibb talks about hard and soft HRM, hard being more quantitative, rational, data-driven management interests and aligned to vertical integration, where soft HRM has much more on the culture, the history, the commitment, the communication, motivation and leadership, looks at a much longer term perspective. The AMO model relies on abilities, key skills and abilities, motivation, which includes engagement and reward, and the opportunity for employees to express their voice. So you've got employee voice, employee relations, all of these contributing to organizational performance. The HR causal chain mo model starts with performance outcomes. It really begins with what is it we want people to do and then it goes backwards through the chain to in the intended HR practices. So you've got employee HR driving this forward to the performance through the practices and um, the experienced HR practices in line with the psychological contract building trust as a culture and a perception of fairness. And then you've got employee attitudes and employee behavior creating this underpinned by HR, Hutchinson 2013. Horizontal integration is very much going across the organization. You've got bundles of HR practice, for instance, diversity as they are um, expressed for, for instance, in recruitment and then selection and perhaps in training and things like that as well. Vertical in integration are strategies which will support the business and help it to function in its environment. So you're looking at the integration between the business strategy and at the lowest level the individual behavior so that they're contributing to the team and then the department and then the business and the corporate level. Golding looked at that one. Christensen's 2005 model tries to encapsulate this as it looks at vertical capability within the organization. At the top they have the business environment leading to inform the vision, the strategy and the priorities and goals which are changing annually. You've got core capability which you might draw in from outside and then you've got the the um, five areas which go through diversity, strategic and tactical levels. Vertical integration is difficult to achieve because you often have an emphasis on short-term targets rather than HRM or a long-term built um, HRM strategy. The time horizon for HRM initiatives are not often a single year and measurements of HRM contribution are difficult because you can't always demonstrate, for instance, that you've made money, although you could have saved money through canny recruitment. 
the complexity of the business strategy is it planned is it emerging as you go along is it resource based will depend on the type of organization and how mature that organization is and whether you have no business strategy at all gospel and seiko talk about if you haven't got these in place then you won't have a horizontal strategy at all golding looks at universal best practice which is HR practices key to the organization as it as it operates. Best fit divides into contingency and configurational. The contingency, the HR practices must fit with the organizational strategy. So that's where the organizational strategy is dominating and HR can only be effective if it does this. Whereas configurational has much more latitude. There's there are HR practices and they fit with each other as well as with other strategies, but there's much more of an element of planning here. Pfeffer and Jassim talked about universal HRM and linked it to employment, sophisticated recruitment and selection, self-managed teams to create um, high-performance working teams so that it's their performance rewarded. Your training and development is linked to what you want these outcomes to be, and it's a much flatter organization with more employee voice and involvement. Brewster looked at the configurational approach and the opportunity to combine bundles of HRM pra practices which would support and complement each other, leaving a consistent through line through the organization for horizontal integration. The vertical integration is more linking with the business strategy and also with external legal requirements or professional requirements. Deliri and Doty looked at um, prospector and defender st strategies within configurational. The prospector strategy is much more um, opportunistic, looking to be flexible and to respond to what is out there. They, the HRM has a very limited internal role here. You've got an external labour market. You may be recruiting people short term from different bits of the project, whereas the defender strategy is about building. So the HRM has much higher role here because there are career ladders and training and development here. Components of best practice and high commitment HRM include security and internal promotion, very sophisticated selection and selective hiring. You've got training, learning and development which is aligned both to the individual and the team as identified by the strategy. Employee voice, you've got these self-managed working teams, there's a high compensation which is always contingent on the performance, a reduction of status so you have these flatter organisations that are more agile and flexible. Best practice does have limitations. It tends to ignore national and sectoral as well as organisational contexts. They tend to be unitarist, believing that we're all going in the same direction. They don't take into account any pluralist perspectives or the employee perspective having a different agenda. And the, direct of, the direction of this causality is often unclear, so it's difficult to measure. The research on best practice and performance, McDuffie in 95 through to Guest in 2000 and Purcell et al. in 2007, they've been very positive about the link between um, best practice and HRM, but they haven't offered an explanation as to why certain practices are particularly effective, um, apart from Purcell looking at people and performance in their model. So we have leadership underpinning many of this, um, these practices. You've got the biggest competitor in your own view of the future, according to Hockman, and um, you're, you're uh, tying down a vision in a fluid environment. Here we have the classic leader tr triangle where the leader dominates, the follower follows, and they're held together by shared goals. This is changing now as we devolve to the line and HR becomes this one-stop shop which is centralised. We've got many more high-performance working teams and virtual teams with specialist roles where nobody can really manage them because we don't know what they do in the same way. And they've become much more difficult to manage, so they've become self-managed working teams in many areas. So they're identified as being strong teams, they identify as being part of that team, they're highly skilled and they get high value results. 
The virtual teams are separated by space. It can be as little as 50 feet and or time and they use their skills to work together. Frontline ownership is more about devolving to the line, empowering workers to make decisions within their teams that will work for them. Here we have the old leadership triangle on the left that I showed you, the red one, and in the, the on the right you see the positive deviance hierarchy with frontline workers leading the way, making decisions perhaps about budgets and timelines and who will do what within the organisation and the leadership is there to make it happen. We have a range of references and also some um, articles that we've posted up onto the site for you and I hope this has helped to clarify things for you.